erythropoiesis. Let us define this term. Erythro means red, and poiesis means making. So this is the formation of red blood cells, or erythrocytes. We've previously discussed hematopoiesis in part 1. Let us here focus on the red blood cell. So again, we start with the CD34 hematopoietic stem cell. This can differentiate into the myeloid precursor cells. Now there are a few intermediates before we reach the red blood cell. We shall discuss the main ones here. Myeloid stem cells can differentiate into proerythroblasts. These are very immature red blood cells with huge nuclei. These can then differentiate into erythroblasts. Again, very immature, but with smaller nuclei. These again can differentiate into very important cells, known as reticulocytes. So here the erythroblast has lost its nucleus and many organelles, but it's not quite a red blood cell yet. Reticulocytes still contain ribosomal RNA, so it still can synthesize hemoglobin. The normal reticulocyte count in the blood is 1-2%. to The reticulocyte then becomes the erythrocytes, which are the red blood cells, and we all know that red blood cells have a lifespan of 120 days. So what we can see here is that slowly the red blood cell loses its nucleus. This is very important. The red blood cells lack in nuclei and are packed full of hemoglobin. We shall discuss the function of hemoglobin later. Let us focus a little on the reticulocytes. So we have previously mentioned that these are immature red blood cells. They contain ribosomal RNA and are normally present at less than 2%. Now, measuring the reticulocyte count is very important, as it gives a guide to the bone marrow activity. So, you can have an increased reticulocyte count with increased bone marrow activity, for example during hemorrhage or hemolysis, whereas reduced reticulocyte count suggests poor bone marrow activity, such as bone marrow failure. So from this, you can logically determine what will decrease or increase the reticulocyte count, Let's look at these in some more detail. So when you are thinking of the causes of a decreased reticulocyte count, think of anything that can decrease red blood cell synthesis. So if we think of some examples, we have bone marrow failure. Now why does this result in a decreased reticulocyte count? Well, because this is the site of erythropoiesis, and if this fails, red blood cells and other cells, as a matter of fact, can't be produced. Another example will be hematinic deficiencies. And the reason being is that hematinics are required for the synthesis of red blood cells. Other causes include chronic infection, chronic disease, and malignancies. Literally think of anything that can decrease bone marrow activity, including drugs, chemotherapy, and radiotherapy. On the other hand, causes of an increased reticulocyte count are those that increase bone marrow activity. For example, hemorrhage where there is loss of blood and the bone marrow is trying to compensate by pumping more cells into circulation. Similarly, hemolysis, where there is loss of red blood cells, the bone marrow tries to pump more red cells into circulation and because it can't catch up with red blood cell loss, it ends up pumping premature red blood cells. Leukemia, so this is a blood cancer, where there is increased numbers of premature cells. We shall discuss leukemias in the hematological malignancy series. Pregnancy also results in an increased reticulocyte count, because more red blood cells are needed. Now, erythropoiesis is regulated by a growth factor called erythropoietin, or EPO. EPO is produced mainly by the peritubular cells of the kidneys, but can also be produced by the liver. Now, importantly, the production of EPO is regulated by tissue oxygen tension, so its production increases during hypoxia, for example during anemia or cardiopulmonary pathologies. So, let us describe this. We start off with hypoxia, or low oxygen tension. Here we have a kidney nephron and the peritubular capillary network within the kidney. Now, I won't go into too much detail into the renal physiology here, we'll save that for the renal series. So, when there is low oxygen, this is detected by the cells in this region, the cells are like, hey, we need some more oxygen. So they go about producing EPO. EPO then makes its way through circulation, reaching the bone marrow. 
In the bone marrow, EPO triggers erythropoiesis and thus red blood cell production. So now we have more red blood cells being made. Now what you need to know is how oxygen tension triggers EPO production. So again, here we have low oxygen tension within the peritubular capillaries. This triggers the production of a very important factor known as hypoxic inducible factor 1-alpha or HIF1-alpha within the cells of this region. This factor then binds to the hypoxia response element on the EPO gene on chromosome 7. This triggers EPO synthesis. So again, importantly, hypoxic inducible factor 1-alpha binds to the hypoxic response element on the EPO gene on chromosome 7 and triggers EPO synthesis. Now this can go into very complicated detail that is beyond the scope of what we need to know. However, if you are interested in reading more about it, I've included a reference. Let us now talk about the structure of red blood cells. So red blood cells have a biconcave disc shape. So bi means two, concave means that it caves in. A lot of people tend to get confused between concave and convex. Concave means that it caves inwards. So there's an indentation, an inward indentation. And it's on both sides, so biconcave. And it's a disc shape. So if we were to draw this in this view, you can appreciate a central indentation of the red blood cell. The outer part of the red blood cell or the peripheral part of the red blood cell is larger. So it's thicker. And you can appreciate this more if we shade this in as such, shade the whole red blood cell in. And then the outer part tends to be darker compared to the inner part, which tends to be more pale compared to the rest of the cell. So again, it's a biconcave disc shape, it caves in. So the diameter of the red blood cell is approximately seven micrometers. Now, the purpose of the shape and the size of the red blood cell is so that the red blood cell has a high surface area to volume ratio. So this means that oxygen and carbon dioxide can rapidly diffuse into and out of the cells, so in and out of the cells. And this, this is quite important because it allows the cell to function to its maximum, its optimal function. Now, importantly, red blood cells lack nuclei and most organelles. We've previously spoken about how they come about to lack these things during the process of erythropoiesis. This is very, very important. The reason being is that the red blood cells want to pack the interior with as much hemoglobin, so Hb, with as much hemoglobin as possible. We'll discuss the function of hemoglobin a little later and the synthesis and the structure of hemoglobin in the next video. Now, the fact that they lack nuclei and most organelles means that one, cells cannot proliferate, so they can't duplicate, they can't give off an offspring, they are destined to be single, they can't increase their numbers by themselves. And they cannot repair. So if for some reason the cells are damaged, for example during specific pathologies that we shall see shortly, or the use of drugs, or any other circumstance that damages the integrity of the red blood cell, the red blood cell lacks the machinery to repair itself. So they are subsequently destroyed in the liver or spleen. Now, red blood cells as such have a lifespan of 120 days, um, and red blood cells are usually produced at around 1% per day. So 1% of the red blood cells are replaced per day. So now onto the function of red blood cells. This will be more of an introductory we will discuss the synthesis structure and function of hemoglobin, which is the primary component of red blood cells in the next video. Now the main physiological purpose or the main physiological role of red blood cells is the transport of oxygen and carbon dioxide. This is why hemoglobin is so important. Hemoglobin, Hb, 
as we shall see in the next video we'll go into a lot more detail in the next video but hb contains iron or fe the iron is capable of binding to oxygen this here occurs within the lungs so red blood cells travel towards the lungs take up the oxygen and transport that oxygen through circulation to the tissues that need it so once cells metabolize they release co2 the co2 here is converted into bicarbonate or hco3 within the red blood cells this transports the CO2 as bicarbonate from the tissues to the lungs. Once we reach the lungs, the bicarbonate is reverted or reconverted or converted back into carbon dioxide. In the lungs, the carbon dioxide leaves the red blood cell and is subsequently expired. Now this here is very important. Not only does it get rid of the CO2, but it also serves as the second function or the second main function of red blood cells, which is maintaining acid-base equilibrium. Now, if I have completely lost you here, don't worry. In the next video, we'll talk about this in much more detail, including all the steps involved uh, and why this occurs. Uh, so don't worry about that just yet. Now, there are other functions of red blood cells, including antioxidation, tissue protection, and regulation of hemostasis. These are still being investigated and are beyond the scope of what we shall discuss and are beyond the scope of our curriculum. But if you are interested in reading more about this, then I have included a reference. Please like, subscribe and share our content with your friends and on social media pages. Our mission is to develop need to know video content and question banks that remain free for your use. We are unable to keep doing this without your support. Thank you.